Day two. Daylight creeped into the bedroom around 6.30 a.m. according to Jake's watch. He had been awake and listened to the river for the past half hour. He wasn't ready to get out of bed yet. He assumed Steve wasn't ready to get up either because he could hear him snore in the next room. After he lay there for another 15 minutes, he finally decided to get up and brew a pot of coffee on the propane stove. He hoped he would be able to draw water from the hand pump on the porch. He knew if he couldn't, he could simply use some bottled water they brought with them, but he would use it as a last resort. The bottled water was to cook with and drink provided they couldn't get the pump to work. The bottled water was the hardest and heaviest to carry from the car, and Jake didn't want to have to replenish it when they went back into town. They already carried four cases of it from the car to the house and figured it would be enough to last for the full two weeks they planned to stay there. Jake set the propane stove up and sat it on a small wooden table at the edge of the front porch and lit it. He had never primed the pump before, but he had watched his grandpa do it several times. He stepped back into the kitchen and collected water from the cooler. He stepped back outside onto the porch and poured about a half gallon of water down the throat of the pump and pumped the handle before he received any suction. He thought, the suction the pump creates feels like the same type of sensation you get when you plunge a commode or bathtub drain. You can feel through the handle of the plunger when you're about to dislodge something from the pipes. That's how this feels. After he pumped the manual pump lever up and down a dozen times water poured out of the pump spout. Jake hooked up a hose to the pump spout and continued to pump at least 20 more gallons of water out of the well. He pumped the water off the end of the porch and into the yard before he disconnected the hose. Then he pumped enough water to fill the coffee pot. After he filled the coffee pot with water, he carried it back inside the kitchen so he could fill the basket with grounds and submerge it down into the pot. He put the lid on the coffee pot and carried it back outside and set it on the stove to boil. He sat down on the bench and lit up a cigarette. The coffee finished perking just as Steve joined him on the front porch dressed and ready to start his day. Jake asked, do you want any breakfast? No, just a cup of coffee, Steve said after he yawned. Jake stepped back inside the house and brought two cups and a small pitcher of milk with him back out to the porch. He filled each cup with coffee and handed one to Steve. Jake splashed milk into his coffee and sat on the bench. They sat and talked on the porch while they drank their coffee and woke up. Instead of eating anything, Jake sat and smoked a couple more cigarettes while he drank his second cup of coffee. This was a typical breakfast for him. He asked, how'd you sleep last night? Did you get up in the middle of the night to go outside to pee or go to the outhouse? Steve asked. Bluntly, I didn't get out of bed at all last night, but I let loose with a good half gallon when I got up this morning. Why? It sounded like someone walked through the yard, opened the barnyard gate, and walked off toward the outhouse. It has to be your imagination. I don't think so. Things sound differently when you're in unfamiliar surroundings. At night, especially. Things sometimes sound bigger than what they really are. I know that, but I think somebody walked through the yard last night. I have a slide screen in the window on the same side of the house you do. I didn't hear anything. I was practically asleep when my head hit the pillow, though. I must have been more tired than I realized, and maybe I could have slept through it. Could it have been some sort of animal? Jake asked. No. Steve said. It sounded like it was heavy and walked on two feet. Did you see any lights outside from a flashlight or lantern? Steve shook his head. It was pitch black outside, and I really didn't get up to look out the window. I don't think anyone would have messed around in the dark in the yard last night without a good reason, Jake said. Our closest neighbor's nearly four miles away at the top of the mountain. Steve said, I'm done arguing about it for now, but I think I heard someone or something walk around in the yard last night, in the dark, just beyond my bedroom window and leave through the barnyard gate. What about the flattened down areas in the grass, the um, imprints, we found in the weeds in the yard. Yesterday on that end of the house, I can't explain the imprints or what you heard at this point. It was probably some animal like a groundhog or rabbit hopping through the yard and it bumped into the gate and made it sound like the gate was being opened. After we finish our coffee, we'll go and check it out. We've got to go that way to get to the fishing hole anyway. For the next several minutes, they worked to get their fishing gear together. They made small talk while doing so. Steve said, I have to go take a leak. He stood up and stretched and stepped off the porch and walked to the end of the house between the house and cellar to do his business. Steve's comment reminded Jake of something he wanted to ask Steve when he got back. Steve came back to the porch a couple minutes later and continued to rig the lines on both his fishing poles. Jake asked, did you use your chamber pot last night? No, I didn't. Why? We need to use it, 
Make sure you empty it each morning because it'll stink the house up if you leave. It'd sit inside all day. Yeah, that would literally stink, wouldn't it? Jake chuckled and said, We can fish the hole above the barn and then fish our way back downstream to the house for lunch. That sounds like a plan. Jake closed the lid to his tackle box. Bring along anything you want to eat or drink. We can keep our drinks cold by letting them float between a couple rocks in the river. The water's always cold. It can be well over 90 degrees for months on end and the water will usually not warm to anything above 60 to 65 degrees. We don't have to worry about keeping our drinks on ice while we're fishing. Cool. Literally. Jake and Steve stepped into the kitchen and they each grabbed three cans of soda from out of the cooler. They placed all six cans inside Steve's rucksack to make it easier to carry with them on their way to the fishing hole. When they left, Jake closed the front door to the house but he didn't lock it. With their gear in hand, they rounded the side of the house to the barnyard and Jake noticed the barnyard gate. It stood wide open. See, I told you. Steve said. All right, all right. So the gate's open. This was odd to say the least because Jake knew for sure he closed and latched the gate last night. He made sure of it when they came back through it after they returned from walking up behind the barn. Jake had to admit it was fairly strange because no animal could work the clasp which keeps the gate latched. The latch was a heavy duty, wrought iron hook latch which had a small lever that had to be lifted in order to get the hook out of the wrought iron eye bolt it rests in. Only a human could unlatch the gate. The wide open gate is weird, Jake said. Maybe I didn't get it latched completely and the wind blew it open. They looked around through the yard and noticed more flattened down grassy impressions which led from the other side of the yard to the gate. These impressions paralleled the ones they noticed yesterday. These new impressions sort of look like footprints, Jake said. The footprints, if that's what they are, are nearly four feet apart from heel to heel and there's at least eight of them spread across the yard. I can see that. What do you think made them? Jake ignored Steve's question for the moment and looked up and scanned the barnyard for anything suspicious. What are you looking at? Steve asked as he looked in the same direction. Nothing, I guess. Jake said as he glanced at Steve, I was just looking up toward the barn. Come on, we aren't going to let these impressions ruin our first day of fishing. Not for now anyway, Steve said with a sideways glance and tightened lips, you never did answer. My question, what do you think made these footprints? While Jake looked back toward the barn, he said, I really don't know. Maybe the imprints were made from a rabbit which hopped through the yard last night. We can examine them more closely when we get back. Steve temporarily shrugged off the footprints and the open gate while they made their way through it and walked to the fishing hole. Jake continued to look for anything out of the ordinary as they walked through the barnyard, but he didn't see anything suspicious or out of place. The ground in the barnyard was similar to that of the road. It was made of hard, compacted dirt and sand and imprints weren't visible like they were in the flattened grass. Jake had to admit the open gate and the impressions in the grass left him a little bewildered as to the direction their visitor took as he or she walked off into the darkness last night. While they made their way through the barnyard and behind the barn, Steve talked about what he had. Experienced last night. Jake said, tonight, we can build a campfire out in the middle of the barnyard to sit around while we watch and listen for anything moving around in the dark. What are we going to do if the boogeyman shows up? Steve asked. I don't believe in the boogeyman, Jake said as his eyes darted and jaw tightened. Once they made their way beyond the barn, they had to enter the tree line and walk about 75 yards to an old barbed wire fence. They had to climb through the fence to get to the fishing hole, which was located about a quarter mile ahead to their left. Near where they climbed through the fence was where the old dump was located. Jake coughed and said, let's stop and take a look at the dump. Okay, Steve said, his mouth straightened, shoulders slumped. Would you look at this mess? It was apparent someone or something rooted around in the dump. Old tin cans, bottles, and other. Junk was spread out around the pit which contained it. Jake set his fishing gear down and kicked an old. Glass jar back into the pit. Why do you think someone would do this? Maybe someone was looking for old antique bottles, Steve said while he set his gear down next to Jake's. Jake shrugged his shoulders and said, Yeah, you're probably right. We should try to clean this up a little bit as he continued to kick the cans and bottles back into the pit. Steve followed suit and they finished the job within a few minutes. They picked their gear back up and continued onto the fishing hole. It was rough going because the old winding trail which led to the hole had become extremely overgrown. No one had been down it for years. They had to be careful not to get their fishing poles and fishing lines tangled up in the underbrush and trees while they moved along the path. 
The woods were so thick through this part of the property daylight was reduced to nearly half, and the trees cast eerie shadows everywhere except where the canopy thinned out over the top of the river. They continued to walk for another 10 minutes until they reached the edge of the fishing hole. They dropped their gear and baited their hooks and Steve cast his into the water. Jake walked up over another 20 feet or so before he cast. This was to provide enough space so they wouldn't get their lines tangled together. After Jake's first cast, he set his pole down and walked over to a spot halfway between where they fished. He knelt down along the riverbank to build a basin in the river using river rocks. Jake pulled several medium to large-sized rocks out of the shallow water at the river's edge and laid them on their sides to form a C-shape. He built it in such a fashion so the open end of the sea touched the riverbank. He did this so they would have a place to stash their soda to keep it cold and to keep it from floating away. After he put the soda in the basin, he walked back to his pole and reeled it in and cast. Again, they used bread balls and salmon roe for bait. The water in the river was crystal clear, and it was easy to see the fish swim among the rocks under the water's surface. When the sun shined directly on the water, it made seeing the fish even easier. Jake shouted, be careful while you walk around on the rocks near the edge. They're usually slippery, and I'm sure you don't want to fall in and get wet or worse yet break a leg or ankle. Steve shouted, I'll be careful. Don't worry, as he reeled his hook in. On Steve's third cast, he hooked a large rainbow trout. He skillfully landed it and worked to get the hook out of the fish's mouth and put the fish on the stringer. Once he hooked the fish on the stringer, he tossed the fish and the stringer into the river to allow the fish the freedom to move around in the water until they were done fishing. Jake caught another trout on his next cast and put in on the stringer with. Steve S. Fish. Jake shouted, if we keep catching fish at this rate, we'll be done fishing within the hour. Steve chuckled and shouted, at least we'll eat a nice fish dinner tonight, as he cast his line back out to the middle of the fishing hole. Jake couldn't argue with that. They continued to fish for another hour or so, and within that time, they caught a total of eight trout. The largest measured 14 inches long and the smallest 9 inches long. They had caught their limit for one day and decided it was time to head back to the house to clean the fish and get ready for lunch. While they packed their gear to leave, Jake heard a large branch snap across the river. The sound was loud enough he heard it over the din of the rushing water up and downstream from the fishing hole. He looked to where he thought the sound had come from, but he didn't see anything. Jake asked, did you hear a branch snap? Yeah, did you see anything? I was busy with my gear and didn't look up to see which direction the sound came from, Steve said as he closed and latched the lid on his tackle box. Just as Steve finished his comment, a rock the size of a grapefruit sailed over the river and landed in the water within 10 feet of them and splashed them both. They both said, what the fuck? Hurry up and quickly get your gear together. Jake said as he folded his sling chair and picked up his tackle box, we need to get out of here now. A few seconds later, another larger rock sailed over the river and it landed even closer to them. This rock was the size of a large cantaloupe. Someone or something doesn't want us here, Jake said as he walked towards Steve. Steve didn't say anything while he packed up his fishing gear and retrieved the stringer from the water. When he was ready, they got the hell out of there. They quickly got back on the path which led away from the fishing hole and walked back into the woods. With wide eyes, Jake looked at Steve and asked, Did you see who or what was throwing the rocks? No, Steve said while he shook his head, but I did see what looked like movement in the trees walking away from where the second rock was thrown from. It was between two large pine trees. I saw what? Looked like a small patch of dark brown or black fur retreat up the hillside across the river. I only saw it for a split second. Do you think it could have been a deer or bear? I don't think so because it was at least six feet off the ground. I didn't see it because of the way the pine trees jut out over the water. Jake said as he quickened his pace, hurry up because I want to get out of these dark woods. Yeah, me too, Steve said as he walked faster. Before they made it to where they had to climb back through the barbed wire fence they heard, what sounded like a large branch smack a tree trunk three times with a slight pause between each strike. They stopped and briefly talked about the noise. They both agreed the sound came from the other side of the river and it was loud. The sound was so loud it echoed off of the hillsides all around them. It made the hair on the back of Jake's neck stand up. Jake looked at Steve and Steve looked scared. We need to move. Steve said as he walked faster. Jake's facial expression hardened, like now. They quickly made it out of the dark woods and into the openness of the barnyard in the full sunlight. I'm relieved to be out of there, Jake said as he tried to catch his breath. While he looked over his shoulder, Steve said, Yeah, me too. 
They walked in silence through the barnyard and into the fenced yard which surrounded the house. Jake thought both of them contemplated what had just transpired. Jake put his fishing gear down on the porch and Steve followed suit. I want to get a wash pan to fill with water so we can clean the fish, Jake said as he opened the front door and stepped inside. I'd rather clean the fish outside so we won't make a mess in the kitchen. Will you move the propane stove off the table so we'll have room to work? I'll set the stove on the bench out of the way, Steve said as he picked the stove up. Then I'll move the table off the porch and farther out in the yard. Thanks. Jake picked up a butcher knife along with the wash pan and carried them back outside to the porch. He put the knife down on the table and filled the wash pan halfway with water he pumped from the well. He set the wash pan down on the table. He brought the knife with him so he could cut the heads, tails, and fins off of the fish while Steve used his fillet knife to kale and fillet them. They finished the job and cleaned all the fish in about 25 minutes. Jake took the fillets back into the kitchen where he wrapped them in cellophane and then in aluminum foil. He placed the fillets in the cooler until later on that evening where he would prepare them for dinner. Steve emptied the water and fish parts in the wash pan over the riverbank and cleaned it and the knives and brought them back into the kitchen and set them in the sink. He stepped back outside and moved the table back onto the porch and set the stove back on top of it. When he finished, he stepped back into the kitchen for lunch. They settled on another sandwich and a few potato chips. They busied themselves and made their own sandwich. Because Jake stood closer to the cooler, he opened it and offered a soda to Steve. Steve declined and said, I'll drink one I brought back from fishing. Once they were ready, they stepped back out onto the front porch and sat to eat. Steve reached into his rucksack to get a soda. Steve looked over at Jake and said, they're still floating in the river. Jake stood and handed Steve his unopened soda and said, after lunch, we can walk back to the fishing hole and get them, as he stepped back inside the kitchen to get himself another one. He stepped back outside and sat back down to eat. Have fun, Steve said. I'm not going back there. Don't be such a big chicken, Jake said as he threw a potato chip at Steve. It'll only take us a few minutes to walk back to the fishing hole to get them. No, Steve said as he threw the potato chip back at Jake. I'm still not going back there with you. I'll go by myself when I'm done eating, Jake said as he rolled his eyes. Go ahead, but don't scream for my help if someone or something chases you out of the woods again, or worse yet grabs a hold of you. Don't worry, I won't. You big wuss, Jake said as he threw another potato chip at Steve. After Jake finished, he stepped back into the kitchen and cleaned up and threw his paper plate away and put the lun meat, cheese, and mayo back into the cooler. He finished his soda and threw his can away. Are you sure you don't want to go with me? No, Steve said. I'm going to gather firewood and carry it into the barnyard so we can get a campfire going later this evening. Jake stepped back outside and said, okay and headed off to retrieve the soda. He made his way uneventfully down the trail through the woods to the fishing hole. He walked to where he placed the soda cans in the water, and they were gone. The basin remained just as he built it, but the soda was gone. Jake looked to his right toward the direction where he stood fishing just a few hours earlier and discovered. On the ground, in plain sight, a giant humanoid footprint in the wet sand along the riverbank. Jake stepped closer to the bare footprint so he could examine it. The footprint appeared just over 18 inches long and at least 7 inches wide across the ball of the foot. It contained five massive toes which angled right to left, from the big toe to the little toe respectively. Jake stood next to the footprint and compared his size 13-inch sneaker to it. The footprint dwarfed his sneaker. It was at least 5 inches longer than the length of his shoe and at least 2 to 3 inches wider. The footprint appeared at least 2 to 3 inches deep in the wet sand. When Jake stepped in the wet sand beside the print, he barely left an impression. Jake weighed 230 pounds and stood 6 feet, 2 inches tall. Examining this footprint made him realize two things. One, whatever made it weighed significantly. More than he did, and two, it was taller than he was. After he made these realizations, he quickly scanned the area and retreated from the fishing hole as quickly as possible. It also occurred to him. Whatever made the footprint took the six cans of soda and still lurked around somewhere close by. Jake quickly navigated the trail out of the woods to where he had to climb through the barbed wire fence. As he climbed through the fence, he heard a large twig or branch snap on the trail several yards behind him. He found the courage to look back to see if he could see anything but nothing was there. It would be difficult to see anything anyway because the trail was too overgrown with underbrush and provided barely enough room to maneuver down it. Jake made his way out of the woods and into the barnyard. He was shaken but not too scared. 
He decided he would tell Steve the soda was gone, but he wasn't going to mention the footprint. If Steve pushed too hard and asked where the soda went, Jake would tell him it floated off downstream. When Jake walked past the barn, he saw Steve deposit what looked like the last of three loads of chopped firewood on the ground next to the campfire ring. Steve had carried the wood quite a distance from the woodpile to the campfire ring, which sat in the middle of the barnyard. It sat about 75 feet from in front of the barn in the middle of the barnyard. Jake joined Steve at the campfire fire ring. Do you plan to keep the fire burning all night? He asked as he wiped sweat from his forehead. Steve chuckled and said, Yeah, what I saw earlier while we fished could be what came through the yard last night. Don't be ridiculous, Jake said as he glanced to his left. What you saw was probably a deer or bear. You admitted you saw it for only a brief second, and you said you weren't sure what it was. Jake could tell something bothered Steve because of his lack of playful conversation while he ate lunch, and because he didn't want to go with Jake to retrieve the soda. Steve seemed on edge and continued to skin the tree line in the back of the barnyard. Jake asked, what's wrong? Steve asked, do you think this will be enough wood to keep the campfire burning all night? As he looked at the moderate-sized pile of wood. It looks like it, Jake said as he looked at the pile but I'll help you carry another load just to be sure. Jake wondered if Steve saw something along the tree line while he was in the woods earlier because Steve continued to glance in that direction while Jake talked to him. They returned to the woodpile and gathered a huge armload of firewood and carried it back to the campfire ring. After they deposited it, they walked back to the porch to sit and rest. Jake looked at his watch and it indicated it was 2.30 p.m. and he asked, after we rest for a little while, why don't we take a walk on the other side of the property to the old log cabin my grandfather built? It's on the hillside and overlooks the old garden, the bottomland, and the retreat. Yeah, Steve said while he swung on the porch swing, there's still plenty of time to kill before dinner and before it gets dark. I don't want to sit around here. Jake stood with his right hand on his belly. Yeah, it'll be about four hours until it starts to get dark. We've got plenty of time to look around. Give me a few minutes. I need to go take care of business in the outhouse. My lunch is working on me and I haven't taken a shit since before we got here yesterday. I'd take another roll of toilet paper with you because I used the outhouse earlier and there isn't much left, Steve said as he glanced toward the porch floor. Jake's jaw dropped, his eyes narrowed. You've already gone through two rolls of toilet paper? Not quite, Steve said, barely making eye contact with Jake. There might be a quarter roll left. With his hands on his hips, Jake asked, what did you do with it? paper the trees. I lined the hole in the seat with one roll and used the other one to wipe, Steve said and grinned. The seat was cold and the wood would have irritated my sensitive side. Jake laughed and grabbed another roll of toilet paper from the package which sat on the porch. He also grabbed his cigarettes and lighter from off of the bench and walked off to take care of his business. Before he rounded the corner of the house he said, I'll be back in a few minutes, as his jaw tightened. Steve chuckled and shouted, don't fall in and don't forget to flush. After Jake finished his business, and while he walked back to the porch, he could hear what sounded like a truck coming down the mountainside on the dirt road behind the house. As he entered the gate, a black pickup truck became visible as it rounded the curve in the road above the barnyard. When Jake rounded the corner of the house to pick Steve up for their walk, he wasn't there. Jake called out to him and then spotted him on the outside of the fence near the wash house. Steve stood and looked across the river as Jake approached him. What are you looking at? Jake asked as he looked in the same direction. I'm looking at the island running down the middle of the river. Jake lit a cigarette and took a couple drags. The island runs down the middle of the river from about where the fishing hole starts where we fished earlier. It runs almost all the way to where we would have forded the river. It stops a couple hundred yards before this fork of the river empties into the main river. The part of the river on this side of the island is somewhat narrower than it is on the other side. The island itself is as wide as 30 feet across in some spots and as little as 3 feet in others. It's entirely wooded and the ground is rocky. The river itself is nearly 20 yards wide in some spots on the other side of it. They turned around toward the road and watched the truck make its way to the bottom of the hill and continue on toward the fort. While he tried to see who drove, Jake said, I doubt that whoever's driving spotted us because they're driving too fast. There's no way they can get through the river because it's still way too deep. Not even a large pickup like that one can afford it. They'll come back up the road shortly. Do you know who it is based on the vehicle? Steve asked as he glanced at Jake. No. Jake said as he watched the truck disappear around a curve farther down the road. But it could. Be the neighbors from the top of the mountain. They do make it down this way sometimes. If it's the...
Neighbors, they'll probably stop on their way back because they'll see the car gate standing open. They do check on the place from time to time. They made their way to the car gate and turned left onto the road which led past the old overgrown, weed-infested garden which lay to their right. They walked for 100 yards before they heard the truck. Come back up the road. Jake looked to see if he could see the truck. We should probably stop and wait until the truck comes by before we continue on because the trail to the cabin is just a few yards ahead. The pickup barreled around the curve and only slowed down enough to keep from rolling over. The driver gunned the engine and took off like a bat out of hell as he and a passenger passed by. Jake and Steve had to jump to the roadside to get out of their way. The driver and passenger gave them a nod and a tight-lipped smile when they passed and continued on up the mountain. Steve gave them the bird before they vanished out of sight around the curve. With his eyebrows lowered and dark squinting eyes, Steve looked at Jake and asked, Do you know who those assholes are? No. Jake said as he shrugged his shoulders, I've never seen him before. After they brushed the road dust off themselves, they stepped into the road and continued on there. Way to the main trail which led to the old log cabin. Jake said, the owners of the retreat asked my grandfather to build the cabin for their kids to use as a playhouse when they stayed the summer here. Grandpa agreed to do it not only for them, but so he and grandma could take refuge in it if the river ever flooded. As far as I can recall, they only had to use it twice during the 60 plus years they lived here. Have you all ever had to use it while you visited? Steve asked. No, but I can remember one time when the river raised and ran level with the top of the riverbank in front of the house. That would have made it nearly 15 feet deep. When it's that high the water's extremely swift and muddy, and there's no other way out of here except to climb the mountain. It was like the main river is now. That'd be scary. The cabin sat roughly another 50 yards ahead to the right up the trail. When Jake's grandpa built the cabin, he built it so it sat sideways on the hillside. The front door of the cabin faced down the hillside in. The direction of the road. Jake and Steve were about halfway to the cabin. The constant upward climb. Made Jake short of breath and his smoking didn't help either. Jake stopped. Can we stop and take a breather? Yeah. I need to rest for a minute too. While they rested, they stood and looked over the bottom for a few minutes. They heard an odd whistle ring out farther up the trail and around the curve near the spring. Steve said, that's a weird sounding bird. Yeah, there's a lot of weird sounding birds around here, Jake said and asked, have you ever heard a whippoorwill? No. What do they sound like? Their call sounds just how you pronounce their name. Jake explained. Whip per will. The whip starts out normal. The pour drops down in pitch and the will is stretched out as it raises in pitch. Jake whistled the sound a few times. The bird they heard farther up the trail answered each time Jake whistled. They continued on and Jake had the key out of his pocket to unlock the cabin before they reached the door. Jake unlocked and opened the door and stepped inside and invited Steve in behind him. The log. The cabin was one large room which measured approximately 25 by 25 square feet and contained a couple army cots, a small table, a set of freestanding wood shelves and a small wood cook stove. A large shuttered window was centered on the right wall of the cabin. The window overlooked the retreat and bottomland below. There was just enough room inside the cabin so two people could live comfortably for a couple weeks at a time. They stepped back outside and Jake closed and locked the door. They stood and looked over the hillside to the retreat and the old garden below. While they stood there, Jake said, The 30-acre field is what we hillbillies aptly call the bottom or holler. I prefer to call it the bottom. Why the bottom? Steve asked. I don't know. I just think it sounds better than the holler. That's all. Anyway, the bottom is where Grandpa would plant field corn for animal feed and cornmeal. He didn't plant the entire field. He only planted about 10 acres of it. The rest of it's just open bottomland. While they continued to look over the bottom, they noticed several trails of flattened down areas of grass and weeds which led in multiple directions. Some of the trails led to the lower part of the bottom, while others led toward the yard which surrounded the retreat. They also noticed other trails which led toward the river and still others which led toward the swinging bridge. Steve pointed to a set of impressions that led to the bottom of the hillside below the cabin. From this distance, the impressions look like the ones we found in the yard. Jake said, these trails were made by deer or some other type of animal. They're too big for that, Steve said as he stood with his eyes narrowed and mouth twisted. To change the subject, Grandpa used to manually plow the field with an old horse-drawn plow which he hitched Barney up to. That's a lot of land to plow with a horse. You're not kidding. I had to help Grandpa plow it a couple times. Just think how hard it would be to have to manually harvest all the corn. 
I wouldn't want to have to do that either. I remember helping Grandpa load up more than 50, 50 pound feed sacks with hand shucked corn on a horse drawn wagon. We had to take the corn to a water driven grist mill in Walkersville to be stone grounded to corn meal and corn flour. Walkersville is the little town we passed through several miles before the turnoff which leads here. Moving all that heavy corn was a huge undertaking. Walkersville is also where my mom and dad eloped and were married in a little country church. Steve tapped his foot and looked toward the ground. So what else is there to do around here? Because we're so close to the spring, I want to walk up the trail and see if it's still flowing. It's only another couple hundred yards on up around the curve. No problem. I want to see it too. Jake looked at his watch to see it approached 5.45 p.m. and said, We'll have to hurry because it'll be getting dark soon. Steve agreed, so they picked up their pace and reached the spring in under 10 minutes. The spring still flowed. Jake explained, this was the only freshwater source prior to my grandparents having the well dug in the yard at the house. They'd have to carry water from here to the house whenever they needed it for cooking and drinking. That's a long way to have to carry buckets of water. I bet your grandparents were happy when the well was installed. No doubt. They cupped their hands under the pipe where the water came out of the spring and brought the cold and refreshing water to their mouths for a quick drink. Jake noticed several large bear footprints in the mud in the area near the spring. The footprints resembled the one he saw earlier at the fishing hole. Except these were of different sizes. He didn't point the footprints out or say anything to Steve about them because he didn't think Steve noticed them. We need to get going, it'll be dark soon. Jake said as he turned and started his descent down the trail to the house. Steve followed close behind him. On their way down the trail, Steve said, there's someone walking down the road toward the fort. They both stopped to look and see if they could see the person, but the brush was too overgrown along the road to see anything. Steve pointed to an opening in the brush several yards ahead of the direction the person was headed. We should be able to see them in that clearing when they pass by. Jake nodded and they continued to stand there and wait. A couple seconds later, they saw what appeared to be a large person walk by wearing black from head to toe. Jake said, that's odd. We should be able to discern clothing lines, Steve said. That guy looks like he's wearing a black sweat jacket and hood. Jake said, it looks that way because it's getting dark and we're watching them from such a long way away. Steve looked back down the trail. We'd better get a move on if we want to get back to the house before dark. Jake agreed, and they made it back to the house by 6.49 p.m., just as the last shards of light made their way over the horizon and the house was plunged into dark gray and black shadows. Jake said, go fetch and light a lantern so we can take it with us to the campfire. Steve fetched and lit the lantern as Jake rounded up a frying pan and some cooking oil, a spatula, salt and pepper, paper plates, plastic forks and knives, two bottles of water, and some paper napkins. They made their way around the side of the house to the barnyard gate and discovered the gate stood open. Since Steve carried the lantern, Jake said, go on ahead to the fire ring and get the campfire going. I've got to go back and get the fillets out of the cooler. I forgot them. Steve said, okay, but hurry, as he glanced toward the barnyard. What, Jake asked, are you afraid to go out into the barnyard all by yourself? I'm not afraid to admit it. Yeah, I'm a little scared. Don't be such a big baby. There's nothing out there that'll get you. How do you know that? Steve asked as he lifted the lantern to head level and looked Jake straight in the eyes. I don't know that for sure, but I highly doubt anything will bother you while you're carrying the lantern. If something jumps out of the shadows at you, throw the lantern at it and run like hell back to the house. Steve didn't find that amusing. He clutched the lantern tighter. Jake walked back to the kitchen and gathered the fish and made sure he had everything he needed. He stepped back outside and walked out to the campfire to join Steve. Steve had barely gotten the fire. Started by the time Jake got there, and he asked, Do you notice anything odd? As he held the lantern up. No. Jake said as he looked through the dim lantern and firelight. Steve said, Look at the firewood we stacked earlier. It's been scattered all over the place. Jake said a blank expression on his face. There's gotta be someone around here messing with us. It's possible. Jake said as he continued to look at the scattered wood. Do you think it could be the hillbillies which almost ran us over earlier? I don't know them, Jake said as he glanced towards Steve. It's quite possible it could be one or both of them. Based on the person we saw who walked down the road earlier, we know there's at least one person running around here. Steve said, I'll feel safer if we get a big, roaring fire burning. Put your stuff down and help me get it going. Jake said, looking at how someone scattered the firewood, I agree with you 100%, as he set what he carried down. 
Steve carried the lantern while Jake looked around and gathered a few handfuls of sticks and twigs and placed them underneath the firewood to get the fire started. It took a couple of tries to get it going, but once the seasoned firewood ignited, it burned hot and fast. While Jake waited for the firewood to burn down to embers so he could cook the fish, he helped Steve res the firewood into two neat piles. They stacked the wood in such a fashion they each had a place to sit on either side of the fire. It was completely dark, and the glow from the campfire prevented them from seeing no more than 15 feet in all directions beyond it. It was evident to both of them they were feeling a little on edge. They observed each other as they looked over each other's shoulders and their own while they sat near the fire. The wood had burned down and Jake began the process to cook the fish as he placed the cast iron frying pan directly into the hot embers. He splashed a couple of quick dashes of canola oil into the frying pan and placed about a third of the fish fillets into the oil once it was hot. He sprinkled the fillets with salt and pepper and turned them over a couple times. Within as little as six to seven minutes, they ate some delicious river trout. Jake said, I don't think anything tastes as good as food that's cooked over an open campfire. Steve nodded. As soon as Jake finished his dinner, he cooked the remainder of the fish fillets so they would have something left over for lunch the following day. Cleanup was easy because they threw their garbage into the fire. The only real cleanup was retrieving the hot frying pan from out of the embers which Jake did as he used his shirt tails as a potholder. He set the frying pan next to him on a couple pieces of firewood he had placed on the ground. He left the fillets in the pan and covered it with extra paper plates to keep insects and debris out of it. He sat the spatula, oil, and salt and pepper shakers next to the frying pan so he wouldn't forget them when they went back to the house. After Jake removed the frying pan from the fire, Steve placed several pieces of firewood back into the embers so the fire would burn bright again. They discussed the events which happened earlier in the day while they sat there. Steve asked, why would someone throw rocks at us while we were fishing? I don't know, but I suspect we might have been close to where someone's growing marijuana on the other side of the river. Maybe they were throwing rocks at us to scare us away. It worked. The property on the other side of the river doesn't belong to us. All our land is on this side. What about the patch of black fur I saw retreating up the hillside while we were packing up our gear? It could have been a black bear, Jake said. What I saw couldn't have been a bear unless it was walking on its hind legs. The patch of fur was at least six feet above the ground. The bear would have been really close to where the rocks were being thrown from. Don't you think if someone was growing marijuana and throwing rocks at us, don't you think they would have seen the bear? I can't argue with you, brother, because none of this makes any sense. So what? Do you think it was a Bigfoot? Jake asked, his eyes wide, the corners of his mouth upturned. Steve didn't say anything. To break the silence, Jake said, You know when I went back to get the cans of soda, I saw something I didn't tell you about. What? Steve said as he sat upright and leaned forward. I told you the basin I made out of river rock still stood just as I made it. I also told you the soda probably just floated off down the river. Yeah. Steve said as he rubbed his hands together and rocked back and forth. Jake said, I looked about 10 to 15 feet past the basin toward where I fished and noticed a gigantic bare humanoid footprint in the sand along the riverbank. I only noticed a single print and it was a right footprint and it pointed in the direction toward where I stood when I fished. The footprint was about 18 inches long and about 7 inches wide. That's a big ass footprint, Steve said as his eyes widened. I placed my foot next to it and it dwarfed mine. In addition, it was nearly two to three inches deep in the sand. I barely left a mark when I stood next to it. When I looked at it, it dawned on me whatever made it was a lot bigger than me. That's when I got a little spooked and I heard something pounding on a tree trunk just inside the tree line behind the barn while you went back to get the soda, Steve said and asked, did you notice me looking at the tree line when you emerged from the woods? Yeah, Jake said as he leaned closer to the fire. Did you hear the tree pounding? No, I didn't. That might have been because of the sound of the river. It could have drowned the pounding noise out. When I came back down the trail, I heard a large branch snap several yards behind me, and I turned around to see what had caused it, but I couldn't see anything. The tree pounding only happened twice, and then I didn't hear it anymore. We need to put some more wood on the fire to make it really big, Jake said as he threw two more pieces of firewood into the fire. Steve agreed and stood up and threw two more pieces of firewood into the fire as well. The campfire popped and crackled and several sparks floated skyward. Steve sat back down and asked, What about the guy we saw who walked down the road earlier when we were coming back from the cabin? What about him? Didn't you think it was odd because we couldn't see any clothing lines? 
It's not uncommon for people to wear matching jogging clothes, Jake said as he lifted his arms over. His head and stretched and yawned, like black sweatpants with a black sweatshirt or jacket. Yeah, Steve said, but what about not seeing his head? Maybe he had the hood up on his sweat jacket. If I had to guess, it was at least 75 to 80 degrees when we saw him and humid, Steve said and asked, don't you think it's odd to wear such heavy clothes this time of year? It's not too uncommon. Joggers like to keep from cooling off too quickly while they sweat so they wear heavier clothing when they jog. It keeps them warm and from getting sick. Yeah, Steve said, but that guy was walking not jogging. We never did see him come back this way either. He would have had to cross the swinging bridge because he definitely couldn't cross the river any other way. I wonder where he went. Maybe he did come back this way and we just didn't see him. Maybe we were inside the house. For the next couple hours they continued to sit near the campfire and talk. Steve asked, when are we going back to town? We can probably go tomorrow. I'd like to pick up some more ice and get the batteries for them. Flashlights. It's too much of a hassle to keep lighting the lanterns every time we need to roam around in the dark. I'm probably going to have to pick up some more toilet paper too. It's a pain in the ass having to light the lanterns, Steve said while he yawned. Ain't it? I'll be careful with how much toilet paper I use. Jake said, listen to the animal sounds. What animal sounds? Exactly. The lack of animal and forest sounds is extremely odd. Jake said while he tilted his head, we should at least be able to hear something over the din of the river. Steve didn't say anything he sat and listened. After they sat there and listened for a couple minutes, they heard a branch snap inside the tree line behind the barn. Steve glanced over his shoulder and asked, do you suppose someone is back there watching us? I felt like I've been being watched ever since before we got the campfire started, Jake said as he glanced in the direction of the tree line behind the barn. Wide-eyed Steve said, I felt like that too. Jake looked at his watch and it indicated it was way past his bedtime. It was going on 11.45 p.m. Jake said, we'd better pack up and head back to the house. We can leave the fire burn because it'll burn itself out. I don't think we'll have to worry about anything catching fire because we're well out from under any overhanging trees. I need to use the outhouse before we head back to the house, Steve said as he stood up and asked, Will you please come with me and hold the lantern while you wait? Why should I? You wouldn't go with me to get the soda earlier, Jake said and smiled, his nose crinkled. I'm only joking, I'll hold the lantern for you if you'll do the same for me. After they finished their business they walked back over to the campfire so Jake could retrieve the frying pan and other stuff he had brought with him to cook with. After he gathered everything, they headed back toward the barnyard gate and this time it was closed and latched just like Jake had left it a few hours earlier. They made their way to the front porch and back inside the house. Please get the other lantern and light it while I put everything away, Jake said. Instead of leaving one lantern in the living room, we should each take one with us into our bedrooms in case we have to get up in the middle of the night. Steve nodded. I can't wait until we get batteries. I can't wait either, Jake said as he walked over to the door. I left the front door unlocked last night. But I'm gonna lock it tonight. That's a good idea, Steve said while he walked through the living room on his way to bed. The rest of the house settled into darkness after Steve went into his bedroom and snuffed the lantern. Jake felt his way into his bedroom and set the other lantern on the dresser. He had to feel his way over to his bed before he could climb into it. He laid and faced the window which overlooked the barnyard. He could see the glow from the campfire which began to fade. It was just bright enough to light up the area directly around it but not bright enough to keep him awake. As he laid there and looked out the window, he could have sworn before he slipped off to sleep he had seen someone walk through the barnyard between the campfire and the house. His mind convinced him otherwise and he decided he was seeing things and continued to look at the campfire until it lulled him into dreamland. Around 3.20 a.m. Jake awakened with a start. He knew what time it was because he used the backlight. In his watch to see, something huge hit the end of the house. It sounded like it hit between both their bedroom windows. As he used the backlight in his watch, he quickly found his cigarette lighter and lit his lantern. Steve shouted, what the hell's going on? What are you doing in there? It's not me, Jake said as headed out of his bedroom door and nearly ran into Steve coming out of his. Steve asked, what made that loud thud? I don't know. It sounded like something hit the end of the house. It woke me up out of a dead sleep. It sounded like you hit the wall in between our bedrooms. Jake said, I swear, it wasn't me. Come on, let's go check it out. Steve grasped Jake's shoulder. I'm not going out there. Is there a gun in the house? No. After Grandpa died we took all his handguns and rifles home. Steve said, 
There's no way in hell I'm going out there to investigate without a gun. Sit tight. I'll be right back, Jake said as he turned to make his way to the kitchen. I want to see what. Hit the house. Steve let go of Jake's shoulder. You're nuts. Don't be such a pussy, Jake said as he walked toward the kitchen. Before he could get the door open, something hit the end of the house again. At that instant, he rethought his idea about going outside to investigate. He walked back into the living room. What? Steve asked with a smirk on his face. Did you chicken out? Yeah, Jake said as he glanced towards Steve's bedroom. Maybe we can take a look through your window. Maybe we can see what's going on from there. Steve agreed and followed Jake into his bedroom so they could look out the window. They cautiously approached the window because it had the slide screen in it. Jake walked to the right of the window to peer out into the yard. The campfire had completely burned out and he couldn't see anything but pitch blackness. Jake said, take the lantern into the living room because I can't see past the reflection it's. Casting on the slide screen and window pane. When Steve stepped into the living room, a loud crash echoed throughout the house along with the sound of broken glass as it hit the floor. Jake immediately jumped back from Steve's bedroom window just as Steve ran into him from behind. Steve hit Jake with such force. Had he still stood directly in front of the window, Steve would have knocked him through it. What happened? Jake asked, his eyes wide. The noise came from your bedroom. Steve said he looked wide-eyed in that direction, his mouth. Open. Light your lantern so we can see what the hell's going on, Jake said. Steve quickly lit his lantern using Jake's cigarette lighter while they approached Jake's bedroom. Once inside his bedroom, it was evident what had happened. Someone hit the slide screen so hard it bent it in two. It knocked it out of the window frame to the inside of the house and it lay underneath the window on the floor. The window crashed down, and in doing so, it caused the lower window pane to shatter. Tiny shards of glass lay everywhere on the floor underneath the broken window. Jake said, because everything happened so fast, I didn't get a chance to see anything out your bedroom. Steve put his index finger to his own lips to hush Jake in mid-sentence and get his attention so Jake could hear what sounded like someone breathing heavily just outside the broken window. Jake stopped, talking and listened. He could hear it too. Whatever it was sounded big. Its breathing sounded labored and raspy. It sounded like it paced back and forth between Steve's bedroom window and Jake shattered. One, it paced back and forth for a few minutes. During the time, Jake got his courage up to once again look to see if he could see it through Steve's window. He walked back to Steve's bedroom and as he approached the window, whatever it was sounded as though it walked away from the house and toward the barnyard gate. When Jake stepped closer to the window, he could hear something fumble with the gate latch. He heard the gate creep open and whatever it was sounded like it walked off into the darkness. Steve remained in the living room and whispered, can you see anything? Can you see anything? Can you see anything? Jake whispered, no, it's just too dark. Whatever it was apparently left because I heard it open the barnyard gate and walk off. Steve whispered, are you sure? I believe so. I can't hear anything breathing outside your window anymore and I heard it's heavy. Footsteps says it walked away. Because of the way this thing sounded, I don't think it's human. It sounded huge. Its breathing was loud and raspy and it sounded like it walked on two legs. Steve moved to his bedroom doorway and whispered, What do you think it is then? We might as well go ahead and stay up for the rest of the night. Jake said as he turned and walked toward the kitchen, We can go and sit at the table. I'm not going outside to make coffee. We'll have to drink a couple sodas until the sun comes up. That's okay, Steve said as he followed Jake. I wouldn't want to be outside if that thing comes back. That's exactly why I'm not going out there. After you and I calm down, you should probably go take your sliding screen out of your window. I'm going to take the other one out of mine. Steve nodded. That's probably a good idea. Jake walked around to the other side of the table and removed the slide screen from the side kitchen window. He sat at the table and opened a soda and lit a cigarette. Steve joined him at the table. They sat there for a little while in silence. They listened for the creature or the Bigfoot or whatever it was to return. After Jake smoked and put his cigarette out, he got up and walked to his bedroom to remove the slide screen from his other window. Steve followed suit and removed the screen from his window as well. Jake shouted, it might be a good idea to lock your window. Don't worry, I already did. After Jake removed the slide screen and locked the window, he shouted, will you come help me move this chest of drawers in front of the broken window? Yeah, Steve said as he walked into Jake's bedroom and over to the chest. I can repair the window when the sun comes up, Jake said. We can go to the barn and get some boards to nail over it. That'd be a good idea. 
Steve waited in the bedroom while Jake went to the kitchen to get the broom and dustpan to clean up the broken glass before they moved the chest in front of the window. The chest was heavy, and it was all they could do to push it three feet from where it sat on the wall next to the broken window to its new location in front of it. Jake said, since we're planning to go to town later, instead of boarding the window up, I'll measure it and pick up a replacement pane, some glazing points, and some glass putty so I can fix it properly when we get back. That sounds like a plan, Steve said. They returned to the kitchen and Jake sat at the table while Steve got a can of soda from the cooler. Before he sat down, Jake said, after the sun comes up, I want to go check out the end of the house and see if there's any other damage. I'll come with you, Steve said as he opened his soda. Jake stood and walked over to the cooler and moved all the soda from that cooler into the one which contained their perishables. He wanted to take an empty cooler to town so they could bring a few bags of ice back with them. Please tune in next week as we continue on with the next installment of A Journey Through Hell and Back. For those who cannot wait, this title is available on Amazon.com. A link to the book is available in the description below the video. Please remember to like and subscribe so you won't miss out on the continuing saga.